It looks good. Perfect. Okay, we can go with this. Yeah. Uh, this was uh, my second book, my third book actually, um, 1966 to 208, uh, Camera's Passport, uh, photographs from Hollywood, where I lived from 1973 uh, until uh, 1987. Uh, we have a number of uh, people. Here we have Barbara Streisand on the left giving a judo chop uh, to Chuck Norris. Here we have Cheech and Chong, who were, uh, I think uh, uh, Chong is still working. I see his face in a few uh, Quentin Tarantino films now and then. Uh, this was interesting for me, just something Hollywood and Vine, the most famous corner in Hollywood. Looks like American Airlines pulled out and the store was for rent. This one, many people don't understand, Schwab's was the famous drugstore where all the actors came and hung out for coffee, uh, met each other. I think the story is that Lana Turner was discovered there, but I'm not 100% sure. And then also we have the comedy store on Sunset Boulevard, a lot of the uh, the names that we know, David Letterman signed the wall, Jay Leno signed the wall, Freddie Prince. There's a story there in Freddie. Karen Black, I remember her best from Easy Rider. Uh, she played uh, uh, one of the hookers in New Orleans. Uh, with uh, the Duke, uh, John Wayne, who I think is an American icon, uh, and he was at a tennis match, and I thought, he was holding a tennis racket, and I thought, damn, it'd be cool if he would use the tennis racket as a guitar. And I said, John, would you mind playing it like a guitar? He did. I mean, those are one of the moments that, uh, that I really liked. Uh, today, you would probably see somebody playing, uh, playing uh, air guitar. We're familiar with that. That was my John Wayne. <laughs> Uh, here we have Tom Waits uh, during an interview he did. I was sitting just maybe three, four feet from him. Uh, he was smoking during an interview. Uh, it was when he released uh, the album Blue Valentine, which is a classic uh, Tom Waits album. Here we have the cover of my book, uh, Tina Turner at an outdoor concert, the Seattle Pop Festival in 1970. I like uh, shots like this. This was in West Hollywood. Obviously a Cadillac does, doesn't quite fit into the garage. And uh, so it's tied down with an Abdul license plate. Don't ask me who Abdul is, but I like the fact of uh, the, the setting. Uh, here we have Steven Spielberg at home holding a flute and uh, People say, uh, young Steven Spielberg, of course, it was 1976. And that's part of your icebox. That's part of the icebox series of people who I visited and wanted to photograph with their uh, refrigerator. And Steven was one of the candidates. Here's a Jack Nicholson taken at the American Film Institute. Uh, people would just drop by. It was an amazing place. It wasn't, uh, wasn't a college. It wasn't... Uh, a photo workshop. It wasn't a filmmaking uh, studio. Just people uh, stop by and chat, and, and Jack was one of those people. Mm. So the books. Uh, this book uh, was your second book. Uh, my third book, the if third I count book. Poker Face okay. One. Third book, and third it's book. divided into three sections. Uh, basically, three sections. Um, I might mention this because of uh, somebody we, uh, a mutual friend. This is Patti Smith, uh, and uh, this was at a concert in Venice, uh, California. Uh, the picture is 1979. It'd be interesting if uh, I could get a picture of Patti to Patti. It'd be great. Uh, this man I liked very much, Vic Morrow, actor. Uh, if you remember, he was in a film that I really liked with Glenn Ford called Blackboard Jungle. And the opening soundtrack to Blackboard Jungle is one, two, three o'clock, four o'clock rock, the Bill Haley tune. 
And that was the first time I connected music to a film. It was so dramatic. Uh, in fact, uh, it plays in my head even today. And Vic Morrow played uh, the, the guy with a switchblade knife that was constantly irritating Glenn Ford, who was the teacher. And he, uh, it was an amazing film. I recommend it to anybody that enjoys film. Okay, let's see, let's find another place. Here's another shot of, uh, from the series Icebox. Uh, this was Linda Carter, who played Wonder Woman on television uh, in 1975. Also a shot of Sammy Davis Jr. with a little, uh, little adoring girl that's looking at him. This is sort of cool. This was uh, Jacques Cousteau Day uh, in Beverly Hills. Uh, this was uh, 1976. Cousteau, Cousteau, David Crosby, Graham Nash, and uh, a few other musicians. This is Graham Nash, who's also a great photographer. He did a book called Eye to Eye and uh, had a um, had uh, the book and his photographs of Crosby, Stills, and Nash backstage uh, displayed in Seattle. This is David meeting uh, Crosby. This is Jane Fonda and Graham Nash at the event. And here's my famous Jimi Hendrix shot. Uh, Jimmy uh, in Seattle, 1968, backstage. Uh, this is photograph has probably been reproduced many, many times in books and stories about Jimmy, and I sold my rights uh, to uh, Paul Allen. Mm. Uh, this is another shot of Johnny Moss, one of my favorite portraits. Uh, the lighting is wonderful, uh, and uh, this is the grand old man of, of um, high stakes poker. He could go for days and days and days, outlast the kids by a long shot. This is uh, Puggy Pearson uh, with his classic, uh, classic cigar, uh, and he's now gone. I think there was a great story about Puggy. He attended a poker session at some nightclub or bar in Texas. He didn't want to bring in all his cash, so he put it in a, uh, in a tin can and uh, parked his trailer over the tin can and uh, went to play poker. And at the end of the evening, or maybe much, much later, he came back out, drove away, and then he remembered. He'd left the cash in the tin can, but in the desert, he could, didn't know where to find it. He never found the money. <laughs> he had hidden it so well, he, he couldn't retrace. Uh, this is Jack Treetop Strauss. I mentioned him earlier uh, with a chip and a chair. In 1982, he thought he was uh, gone from the table. Uh, he had gone all in with every chip, but there's one chip tucked away in the velvet there, and that's what he came back with, and he ended up winning the World Series of Poker. Somewhere in the back here. Oh, this guy's interesting too. He created a sensation uh, by showing up. Uh, his name was Chris Moneymaker. He was an accountant. A bloody accountant, for God's sake. But Moneymaker gave the, the viewing public the idea that anybody can come to this and, and win at poker and win the World Series of Poker. Uh, so this advanced poker in, in terms of the following year, after he won, the crowd doubled in terms of uh, participants. I like this picture because it shows that women are making... Uh, some serious moves into poker. The table is all men, one woman. And uh, I would bet that in the next 10 years, a woman will win the World Series of Poker. Uh, I remember Amarillo Slim saying that if a woman ever wins this thing, uh, he will shave off uh, all the hairs on his legs <laughs> because it just can't happen. On the street. When were you living in California? I was living in uh, Los Angeles from 1973 to 1987-88 and that's where my journey took a strong turn and I started uh, coming to Riga where we are today, mm. uh, sitting today and talking. <laughs>
This is a Riga shot. This was a wonderful, this is the kind of uh, graphic Art Nouveau design you see in many Riga doorways. Uh, just priceless. There's a building just up the street here that's abandoned and probably it will be taken down that has this kind of a mermaid just up the street here. It's, it's sad, but you can't, sometimes these buildings you can't save. They're too far gone. They're too far gone. This is sort of interesting. First day of school, September 1, a couple of kids and a typical Russian uh, headband and this boy is ready for school. Great look, I love the look. Great look. This is interesting. This is the Riga I found on my first trip here in 1983. It says saldeums, and saldeums means ice cream. This was an ice cream vendor in Riga during the Soviet period, and you had a choice of ice cream, vanilla or chocolate. That's all. So you were in uh, during the Soviet occupation then? Uh, well, I got here in 83. A mm -hmm. few people had visited earlier, but it wasn't, uh, the doors were not open for, uh, for uh, tourism. Uh, they just weren't open. For these, any of these images are from the 80s? From, uh, from the 80s, yeah. yeah. So a couple here, 2000. I kept coming back. I mean, I, it became um, a place I wanted to, to be and photograph. This is sort of just a photograph of, um, of Kurt Cobain uh, on a t-shirt in Riga in uh, 1999. Uh, uh, we all know the Berlin Wall came down in 1985. And uh, thanks to, oh, this is interesting, uh, Lennon photo. And what's the ad, uh, a shot of Lennon? This is a Soviet circus here in Riga. This was the kind of play area that kids had. I mean, if you can imagine, uh, in 83, this is where kids could do a merry-go-round. This kid walking to school with his bag. Uh, you can almost see here in the banner, 1917 to 1983. Welcome the revolution, which says, Sovietized uh, Latvia. Cute girl. This was uh, her 16th birthday. Latvian girl. Then I did a series on Yurmala. My friend Janis Kreitzbergs introduced me to the beach photographer, who was just great, Leopold's. And we'd have a little cognac, and he, um, he would photograph the tourists and delivery of his little snapshots went by Polaroid, as we're accustomed to. He had to actually go home that night and make the prints and uh, then bring them back to whoever wanted a print. And that's how he made his money. And you can tell pretty much by the way kids were dressing. Uh, here is Leopold working. He used this as a prop. The little boat was a prop, a background. But this is uh, the way people were dressing back then. Riga, 86. Here's something I learned about photographing Yurmala, why it became important to me. From my Western eye, I could see many people just got into a pose, like a passport office. They sort of had, there wasn't, there wasn't that that freedom of movement, you just sort of, oh, it's a photograph, let me freeze. And that's what they did. And I spotted it fairly early on as I was photographing. Uh, and here's, uh, here's the photographs he presented later. You could come and pick your photograph and for a couple rubles, you could take it home. But he actually had to work all night to get these photos back to the beach and hopefully the tourists were still there. Uh, many of them were Russian tourists. Uh, because th there aren't that many places to go uh, for a beach. Uh, the Black Sea and Yurmala is one of the places that uh, people visited to get a suntan. Your show, your uh, next show. The idea is taking uh, three themes, some of what we've talked about. Uh, the refrigerator series is a good theme. I think I have about 20 which can be displayed uh, here at uh, Birkenfels. 
the other theme is celebrity in all of its, uh, let's say, celebrity that I hadn't paid attention to before. Uh, the Liz Taylor smiling versus the Liz Taylor head-to-foot uh, photograph. Uh, images, I have a shot of Rock Hudson, which I wouldn't have considered because it just a shot of Rock's Hudson's face as he walked off the set of Macmillan and Wife, a popular TV show in the 70s. Uh, uh, even the shot of Dean Martin, I would not have considered uh, because it just somehow gets left behind. As you're looking for pictures, I think in a photographer's mind, you start to think, and I started to think, ah, this is the, the popular imagery. Let's do Alice Cooper. Uh, let's show Elton and Cher. Everybody likes these photographs, and you don't really find the time, particularly in film photography, uh, to go back that much, to eyeball individual negatives which may have value or interest to someone else. So that's part of uh, why I'm in Riga now, is to rediscover images that I let go by. And uh, Tom's can help me do that, by casting a new eye on images that I would not otherwise have considered and may have gone to waste or been thrown out, much like the family album I mentioned, which, which was saved. And I really mean that. How can you express gratitude for something that precious?